move on to our morning keynote, which is one that I'm really excited about. We are going to bring onto the stage here Dr. Karen North, who is a professor as well as director of the University of Southern California Annenberg Digital Social Media Program. And uh, Dr. North is going to be talking about the millennial experience and how we should be thinking about it from a, from a local context. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Karen North. Thank you. It's bright up here. Um, good morning, everybody. Thanks for having me. This is not going to work. OK. Um, so the last thing you want to hear is a university professor lecture. So I'm going to try to click through about 30 slides in about 10 minutes. And then we'll have a conversation and take some questions. This is not my first slide. There we go. OK. Um, so the, the topic I was given was really, this is not your father's local media. And it really isn't. Things have changed so rapidly. I want to introduce, oh, here we go. I want to introduce three topics for you today. The first one is, what does local mean these days? The second one is, who are the millennials? And are they different? And the third is, does technology meet our needs, or does it shape our needs? But let me back up for a second. And if there's one thing that you learned from me today, if you don't already know it, please remember this. We are all social animals. That has never changed, and it will never change. And when you think about behaviors that you see in real life or in digital, you have to remember that people don't change. The only thing that changes is the technologies that mediate our social interactions. We follow social norms, cues, and conventions like conformity, reciprocity, and cooperation. And everything that we use, that we used to do in person, we now do digitally. Think about everything that you do. It's how you live, interact, work, play, network, date, buy, sell, read, view, everything we can now do with digital. And that is something that we never anticipated. Social media, the digital environment, is how we connect and how we communicate. And here's an interesting fact, especially for people who need to reach out for brands or for local businesses. It's blind to geographic proximity. We live in our communities, and we live in our digital or online communities. And that's true of pretty much all of us, regardless of our age or demographic. So the question today is, how do we understand millennials, their sense of local, and the technologies that mediate their social world? Um, I'm going to go now back to our original questions. What does local mean these days? Local's always been important, and it always will be. And it always reminds me of Tip O'Neill, the former Speaker of the House, who all the way back in 1935 said, all politics is local. And he wasn't just talking about politics. He was talking about how important it is to build relationships and make things personal. We've had a clan mentality since the time of the hominids. And it's that local insider knowledge that gives us the ability to understand, influence, and manipulate people. So if you're thinking about goods and services, what do we like? We like things that are convenience, convenient and the convenience of things being nearby. We trust what's familiar. And I've always loved the phrase, I know what I like because I like what I know. And we trust people that we know. And we want to do business and have relationships with people that we know. We don't, we don't, like, um, we, we don't like things that are unpredictable or people that we're not sure of. So with the internet, here's the interesting thing. If you trust what's local and familiar and convenient, the internet is now allowing us to find whatever or whoever we need right around the corner or right around the world. If you need something right now, you can run to the corner store. But here's, and really we're talking about this year, we're now in a situation where Amazon and others, but especially Amazon, is going to be able to deliver anything you need in a half an hour. They're delivering, they're already in Los Angeles delivering groceries in about a half an hour. You can get clothes, jewelry. They're talking about cars. There's nothing that they won't be able to find, acquire, and deliver right away. So is it, if we now go back to the idea of it being personal in a relationship, are we now developing a personal relationship with Amazon or with whichever other seller? Do we go to websites 
or to apps or services or goods from companies that we don't trust? Or are we now developing what feel like personal, local, trustworthy relationships with big companies like Amazon? So what's local these days? It can mean the corner store, it can mean your digital business, or it can be how your business or brand communicates and develops those personal relationships with people. So the good news for a lot of you today is that mobile really is local. That's really the, the game changer these days. And I've never liked the phrase solo mo, but I will use it today. What you find with mobile is that mobile is set up completely to take on the data from your location and the location of things around you, the social data that you, you know, the, and we just sort of talk about that, the information that you put in and that other people like you, your friends and associates put in, and then it combines those so that, um, so that the search content experiences, ads, offers, and other features that are served to you combine your location with your social data. And so for people who are looking for marketing, advertising, goods, and services, you start thinking maybe mobile is the thing that is heralding the renaissance of local. And the best advice is make it familiar, make it convenient, and make it about relationships. Okay, the second thing, millennials, who are they? Um, I'm not a sociologist or an expert on, on uh, demographics, but I will give you a few, a few points on them. Millennials, if you think about when they were born based on you know, what the, the, uh, the borders are, they were born around the time that Apple launched the Macintosh computer. That's the first group of them. And that that generation stops just after the launch of the internet. So these are the people who never knew a time that wasn't, that, where they didn't have some sort of immediate access to friends, information, goods, and services. And I don't know how many of you are old enough to remember before that. I certainly am, and it's kind of crazy that in my adult lifetime, um, and I, was, I worked at the White House at the time that we rolled out the WWW and had trouble remembering what the W stood for, but we, you know, in my adult lifetime, we went from everything being in the physical world to carrying around basically high-powered computers in our pockets. So the priorities of millennials, everybody talks about who are they and how different are they from everybody else. I think a key feature of them is that their relationship with technology is their defining quality. And if you survey millennials, that's what you find. They're all about, we are the generation that does, uses these devices to interact with the world. And therefore, they expect technology always to work and always to be easy. User experience and the user you know, relationship with devices or with stores or with, with others is key to them. They're very, very social online and in the physical world. They're always on, they're collaborating, communicating, talking, asking, um, looking for advice, giving advice, sharing all the time on their devices. And of course, mobile is their technology of choice. On the negative side, there are lots of studies that talk about n narcissism and entitlement. Um, this is the group of people that grew up getting the participant award, regardless of how bad they were. You could be the loser of, the, there could be a thousand con contestants and they all get the same participant award. Um, maybe that's good in some ways, but it does, it does, uh, you know, as a psychologist, I look at things and what you earn, it's really interesting. Professionals teach their kid, if a kid is digging in the dirt, they'll say, oh, maybe you'll be um, an anthropologist. And there are other people who will say, get out of the dirt. And in the same way, there are a lot of prof mostly professionals and more educated people will say to their kids, if the kid says, I'm the best, they'll say, well, you're not really the best, but if you work hard, you can be the best. And we teach contingency. The harder you work, the better you do, or the more you do this, the more you get that. And millennials have not grown up quite with the sense of contingency that most of us grew up with, because no matter who you are, no matter how well you did, you get the same result. Um, not entirely true, but somewhat true. Um, they, and as a result of that, I think, Part of what happens with millennials is that they don't really want to work hard for things. They want things to be easy because it's really about the experience, not really about the destination or the achievement. Um, There's some interesting surveys that look at their intense focus on things like wealth and the sort of lack of caring about politics, which you could argue given some of the engagement, but it really is sort of shallow compared to past generations. 
uh, they're less likely to care about what they call a meaningful philosophy of life, and they seem detached from institutions because they're connected to each other much more directly. Millennials rely on social discovery and the trust of peer groups. They expect everything to come to them. They want news and information to come to them. They want, uh, to, they want music to come to them. They want people to recommend shows and songs. They don't want to go find it somewhere else. They, uh, they, even though they recognize that a lot of the information from social networks is not reliable, it's the easy way to get things. And interestingly enough, they mostly expect to hear things that support their own opinion. They don't, they don't really have the same kind of tolerance for debate. Lots of talk in universities right now about what do we do that you can't have a debate in a class without kids going to the provost and complaining that somebody said something offensive or politically incorrect. Very interesting time for us at universities. Um, I just wanted to point out with all of the social recommendation, what are the most watched things on the uh, channels that kids watch today, like, like YouTube? And it's crazy if you think about it. Everybody knows about things like PewDiePie and Smosh, which are you know people who, and and Stampy Cat, and uh, Sky Does Minecraft. These are all these people who walk through games with funny commentary, or make little videos, or crazy videos, or um, Fail Army, which is hilarious. But the, one that, the, the ones that make me laugh are things like the Disney Collector VR, which is basically a woman's voice and her hands as she opens Disney products, unwraps them, and puts them together. And no, I'm serious, and it, it, look at that, it's, I wrote it down for you guys, 3.7 billion views. People turn it on for their kids as like a bedtime story. Watch her unwrap the Play-Doh. Look at the different colors of Play-Doh. It's crazy. So are millennials different? Maybe they are. They want cell phones instead of landlines, digital newspapers instead of home delivery. They don't get cable or satellite TV. They don't even buy televisions as of the last year or so. But their interest in media is bigger than any generation in the past. So the parsimonious assumption is that millennials are different. And all we need to do is find a special strategy that will target them, that will focus on them. And that's what I keep hearing. But then I think about it. And I remember that we're all social animals. We're all human beings. And as human beings, our human nature really never changes. So perhaps they're not different. Perhaps they're changing because of some kind of environmental circumstances. And perhaps millennials are just a little bit ahead of the curve and we are all following them. Is that possible? So here's my answer to that on the finally side. Finally, does technology meet our needs or does it shape our needs? Your father's social media, as we discussed, what we, some of us, grew up with. You gathered at schools or water coolers to talk about what you heard or saw last night on the news or your TV show or what somebody said, and you had no other way to contact people in a group other than in person. If you wanted to find a new song or hear the song that you heard on the radio and you really liked it, you listened once a week to the top 40 and you hoped that the song that you wanted to hear was there. And then you had to go to a record store and buy that song or that record. Um, everybody had the same information as everyone else. And what did we do? We would hear it on TV, the radio, or somebody would say it, and we would gather together in small or large groups to discuss it and to hear each other's perspectives. And if something was happening, like a TV show, which was only broadcast once ever or once a week, we would anticipate together and wonder about things. Or if it was something in the news, there might be a national dialogue about it. And we shared these moments. We shared them and we shared the same experience of them. The people who were alive and adult or you know, older kids, when these things happen, they all have the same memories. They, they remember when Nixon resigned or JFK was assassinated, when man landed on the moon, when Chuck and Di were married, or when JR was shot, any of these things, when Fonzie jumped the shark, if you were around during any of these things, you heard it and saw it pretty much in the same curated way, broadcast at the same time, written in the same voice, and then we all came together and we had a shared experience with other people around us. And we learned to wait and anticipate because things were not always available. Today, kids can, we, I remember when I was a kid, Charlie Brown shows were on once a year, and everybody told everybody at school, hey, did you hear Charlie Brown's on on Tuesday night? And The Wizard of Oz was on TV once a year, right? 
But now my kids can watch any of those any day, any time, anywhere, because they can find it on some device. So millennials do not share moments in the same way that past generations did. They, they do see them, they do share them, but what they do is they consume media on their own terms, whenever they want, wherever they want, in their own way. And then they share them by posting it and distributing it through channels like Facebook and Snapchat and Yelp. And then, or and everything, I'm not Yelp, but they, they distribute it through all the different social channels. And they do it in their own way, in their own voice, or in the voice of other opinion leaders that they have, which is very different than hearing it on the nightly news or seeing it in the major newspaper, which is a much more curated experience. Um, so they receive information from each other, maybe at the same time because everybody blasts it out, but not in the same way. They can DVR things, their sports, their entertainment, their news. They can binge watch, and they, so they don't share the anticipation or the episode or the moment in the same way. So the new technology does meet our needs because everything is now available at a click, and that is convenient for all of us. And I love this. I saw this in a restaurant. Is that crazy? But what that means is that everything you want is available right now, and it will come to you right here. And that's what the millennials grew up with, and that's what we are all now saying, you know what, I kind of like this. It's super convenient. So we're all becoming more like millennials. And if you look at this, it's, it's amazing to me that it used to be that, oh, the young kids know this and do this, and the rest of us don't, and the grandparents don't have any idea. They don't even know how to set the clock on the device. But now, honestly, the penetration of digital is all age groups. Smartphones, social networks, online shopping, binge watching shows, streaming videos, everybody's doing it from very, very small toddlers all the way through to people who are you know, in their 80s, 90s, and beyond. Millennials got there first, but the rest of us have followed them. And by the way, and, and so I'm saying, I mean, if you think about it, why did that happen? Why are we all following them? Before I answer that as my big oh wow conclusion, let me just say that the unexpected consequences of this digital age that we're seeing with millennials, but we're gonna, we are also finding with our friends and neighbors, is that we no longer have the same attention span, certainly not the delay of gratification, tolerance for boredom, experience of failure or disappointment, or even the sort of experience of winning versus losing, appreciation for opposing viewpoints, because we just look for, you can always find a like-minded person through some digital source or online posting, um, or the desire, we have, a, we have a very much heightened desire for our needs to be met immediately, including at the dinner table, you don't know what something is or where it is, and you just go Google it in the middle of dinner. So why are we developing these millennial-style needs and behaviors? Because technology really does shape our needs and behaviors. So let me close with this. If you give an iPhone or a tablet to a three-year-old or a 93-year-old, within minutes, they will act like digital natives. I will tell you that the three-year-old will get there first. Just saying. The legacy of Steve Jobs is that his obsession with the user experience, I believe, this is my own personal opinion, is what brought us here. He created beautifully designed, uh, a beautifully designed experience where it looks pretty, you wanna be seen carrying it around, and when you look at it, you could sort of just touch it and it will start doing things for you and it draws you in. It's engaging and it's changing our lives forever. If you don't believe me, just ask Siri. Huh. So thank you. Wonderful, thank go. you so much, Karen. I think that there was a lot of really good stuff in there that I think this audience, just like myself when I was talking to you, will probably think about after this panel or after this keynote. One of the things that I think was probably the most interesting was shifting the way that we think about the millennial experience as being a flash in the pan, a moment that we're, what we're witnessing where a certain demographic of people that were literally just born in a certain time are witnessing and experiencing um, our, our life the way that we will gradually in, the, in time. And so I, what I wonder is, is there, is there some sort of expectation that like you and I, for like that 93 year old for example, at what point will they start watching you know, someone knitting on YouTube and making commentary? Like, is that ever gonna happen? Like, are we gonna see uh, a normalization of these habits or is there certain things that are specific to that age group? Well, I mean, we, so we are, the, the, the reality is that if you already are an adult and have a TV, 
the experience of sitting back on the couch or your bed and watching TV is probably not going anywhere. TVs are just getting bigger, essentially. Um, but, and, and, and smaller, because we also watch TV on small devices. But the reality is that people are already drifting toward content that is not traditional content. I think that older people look for more professionally produced content still, so it may not be, the shift may not happen entirely, but you do watch people, and I don't have any data on this, but you do watch people now binge, I mean, you, like, you, I know plenty of grandparents who now binge watch shows. My parents binge watch shows. Because they can. Because they can. So they're like, oh, I found the show, and I don't have the time to watch it, so I'm either going to TiVo it, or I'm going to go buy it, or stream it, and watch the whole thing in a weekend. And then if something is recommended to them in some way, like Fail Army, they will go watch Fail Army, but they may not become subscribers, hard to say. But they've got the ability to go and try it out. And they do. I think that they do. I think that, that we're now watching the experimentation with digital experiences broadening and broadening and broadening. And by the way, it's broadening in two ways, because I don't know if any of you remember this, but it was just a few years ago that people never wanted children to be online or to put their pictures online because they were worried about predators. And now there are billions and billions and billions of pictures online and there are sites and a lot of the sites started out with a lot of security and now they have less security because people have just, it's be, they've habituated to it. It's become so comfortable to be there that now the older people are going there because they're finding content that's relevant to them and the younger people are going there because there are, there's far less uh, concern with their safety. You know, one thing that you brought up earlier on in this presentation was the, the, the notion of personalization is really important now that, um, at least with the millennial crowd, that they feel like they need to be enti they're entitled to having a personal experience regardless of what they're experiencing. With this audience, a lot of times they have to think about the product considerations when they go to market, and what's happening is millennials are becoming, uh, very quickly, the, the primary consumer. They, they've, right. got, they've got they're spending the biggest, power. They're also the biggest uh, uh, demographic group right That's now. right. And so they're going to want to have their millennial experience, so to speak, as they're buying products and services. And so one thing I wonder, maybe if you have some thoughts on, is um, how important is per personalization to the, um, the, to the buying decision process when it comes to non-commoditized you know, products? Like, for example, like if, if it's a millennial business owner, how do you get them to feel like they're getting that personalization experience when they're buying advertising, for example? So it, it would be very complicated to think about exactly how to do it, but I think that the more that you... So if you're, if you're looking at a business and you're trying to draw in a local... Um, you know, local consumers into a business, then I think that other than just the sheer, hey, we have this here, and if you're looking for this, here we are, um, the more you can personalize it, the better. And personalizing it can be anything from making it relevant to individuals, and there are ways to do that, but it can also be um, sort of celebrating the local uh, community or what's familiar and um, you know, people live in, in areas for reasons. So I live in Santa Monica, and when people put up um, information about their businesses and they put it up with images of Santa Monica, I feel like they're a part of my community and I feel more comfortable with them and more um, engaged. So there are ways that you can do it. It's great if you, you saw the, you know, Coca-Cola with their, um, you know, their uh, ability to put names on the cans and bottles and then to send out personalized emails and tweets and you know a lot of this is done with algorithms which can be very expensive and time consuming but to the extent that you could communicate with one person or with one group of people you draw them in if you can't do that then saying the things that resonate with those people are good and by the way you know it's interesting people have been asking why do, it, it, does Donald Trump have such a big social or um, Twitter um, presence but not as many Twitter direct followers as you would expect. And I, I don't know the answer because I haven't, nobody's studied his particular um, pattern, but it strikes me that one thing that he does, and he's gotten in trouble for it, which is how I noticed it, is that he, so Twitter is a very small percentage even of people on social media, but who are those people? The people on Twitter are the communicators. So if you engage Twitter users, then they're likely to spread the word to a larger audience. But what people love on Twitter is to be recognized and validated, and on other social media platforms as well. So what he does is he will retweet 
things that other people say. So somebody will send something to him and he'll glance at it and then retweet it and he's had trouble with some images that were attached to tweets and I'm sure he read the 140 characters and didn't really pay attention. He's like, oh, that's cool and send it out. Well, those people um, love it. They love it that he did that. And so what they do is they tell everybody and they tweet more and they did talk about him. Did you see what he him. did? Did you see what he did? Yeah. Well, I mean, he gets two things. One is that the people who agree with him and then he retweets them, then they love it. They're like, look, look, Donald Trump retweeted me. Just like businesses can do that and they do do it, yeah. right? So if you're, so to the extent that you can validate people's importance by retweeting or liking or sharing or commenting about them directly, then people eat it up and they go tell everybody. So that's, you know, it's a, it's a huge, you know, you guys know about word of mouth marketing. What people don't realize is that the word of mouth part of it on digital, I know you get this part, can, you know, is very shareable and very, you know, can be viral. But the way to stimulate that is to show a little love to some of the individuals who become ambassadors for you. That's what Donald Trump does, which is why he has, I forgot, it's like five million followers, but, you know, exponentially more people interested in what he's doing on social media. He definitely knows what he's doing. And Karen, it's it looks crazy. like we have just run up out on time here. Um, I'm fascinated by this stuff. I think it's amazing. Um, please join me in uh, thanking Karen North and uh, for this amazing, interesting conversation. Thank you so much, Karen.